uh, I just wanted to kind of bring some of the story together. And we are here in the US. And uh, basically the pandemic started, as far as we know, from China, got to the US. And uh, according to the news, and then et cetera, et cetera, um, according to news, the situation in the US is much worse than the one in China. And although the number reporting on China is somewhat questionable, uh, I think that that's probably reasonably true. Um, situation in Europe, particularly in Italy and Spain, is serious. Uh, probably, you know, Italy and Spain are about the size of California. Okay, California is the biggest state in the U.S., California, Texas, New York. Okay, and uh, seems that, um, seems that uh, Italy passed its peak of contagion. Spain is still struggling very badly. Uh, and there is some expansion to other European states. The very interesting experiment going on is in the Scandinavian countries, which are reasonably small and reasonably similar, uh, meaning countries like Sweden, Norway, Denmark, are very similar countries, and they are small. They are the size of a small US state. But uh, Sweden have less, very few restrictions on, they started with very few restrictions. Finland put a lot of restrictions. And uh, in 10 years or in two years, We'll be able to compare those two and see what worked, what didn't work. Okay, now these, I, uh, you know, South America, Africa, and India, uh, we don't know. And they are, I think the pandemic is just starting there. And uh, the advantage in Africa, South America, and in parts of India is that the climate is warm, and the warm climate uh, is less propense for the pandemic. Okay, now, uh, one question is contagion, and I don't know what I wrote on the second comment. Can anyone read this? Immunity. Yeah, I, oh, immunity, immunity. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys read my handwriting better. Uh, and uh, basically what we started to think about two things. Well, we continue thinking about contagion and how the pandemic is moving. But then the, the emerging discussion is immunity, is how, uh, People that have been exposed to the pandemic, uh, are they immune to further contamination? And that's a very, very important thought because part of the policy of reopening the United States have to do with trying to use the fact that these people are immune and using them in the more risky uh, medical and other type of situation. Any comments? I, I think they're still trying to figure that out. Um, and there are, different, um, there are different views about it. They think that there's probably some immunity, uh, or at least for now, for some amount of time. But, um, based on their experience with other um, coronaviruses, that might change because uh, as the as the virus uh, mutates, then uh, people are not gonna, are gonna lose some or all of their immunity. And um, it's important to um, see, I think, what's uh, gonna happen because uh, otherwise, how are they gonna lift the measures? So what, what are they gonna do? I mean, we're not gonna be locked inside the whole time. So yes, I think immunity is, is 
is definitely very important how to get around that. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of epidemiological and uh, medical question. Uh, uh, typically, things like SARS and the other ones, once you had it, uh, you are pretty much immune. I don't know if for a lifetime, but you are immune for a long time. And this is something that they will need to test and, and understand, because if that's true, they can use it. Uh, to fight the pandemic before vaccines are developed. Okay, I'm going to go to my second slide and let's continue talking. And again, my, my handwriting is not the best that I want to, to hand. And I put the life cycle here uh, and uh, trying to kind of understand, uh, understand the the cycle of the situation. A person is healthy or the population is healthy and part of the population get infected. The phenomenon, uh, the phenomenon of infestation, um, I think most of people that are working on it say that uh, uh, symptoms come out uh, two or three days after infestation up to 14, but they don't know. Okay, uh, and uh, you know, our friend Gustavo, who was here, went back to Brazil, and in two or three days he was sick, but he seems to be doing okay, and he thinks he got infected in the airplane. Um, but uh, this is a, in, a very careful time issue that is very important to understand. Now, between a person feeling sick and a person being hospitalized, uh, probably like 10 to 14 days, things get worse and worse and worse. And then in the hospitalization, actually, there are people that cannot be hospitalized. There are no hospitals in the location. There is no place in the hospital. They don't have money to pay for the hospital. They will for have religious reasons not to want to be hospitalized. And this creates a, a, a diversion here on our uh, on our chart. And then from the hospitalized, some of them go to uh, intensive care and some of them die. Okay, and I put 14 days on each element of the cycle, but I have to understand that all of these have different outcomes. Okay, now what I wanted you to think about here the most is that this is a moving structure. Every day we are moving here to here to here to here to here, and the whole thing is moving, uh, but they're still healthy, they're still infected, they're still hospitalized and etc. Now, Testing. And I always feel these days that the worst thing on, uh, on the United States reaction has been the incredible amount of blunders uh, on testing. And I, you know, we have this discussion with Professor Kogan, with Alex, and Alex focuses a lot on deaths. But if you look carefully, that's all the way here in the end of the cycle. And probably about a month after someone got infected or 45 days. So all the cycles, all the numbers you see on TV uh, are kind of a moving target. And measuring that, you're measuring really the phenomena one month ago, and there is a large amount of deaths that are misclassified or they are not recorded because they are not in the system. And no one has the faintest idea of uh, what gets recorded and not recorded. Uh, so I, I find uh, that's very difficult to, to really deal with it, but it's the most uh, is most verifiable uh, 
uh, number. Uh, actually, anything from hospital on are verified numbers to a certain degree. Okay, let me stop here, see if there is any comments. So uh, I have some stuff here. So I feel like uh, for the testing, I think we should have different test focus or test methods for different uh, uh, people in different situations. So for example, um, as you mentioned, there are some people that uh, have the uh, immunity. So why they have that? Is it because uh, it's in the gene or, or, um, or some other reasons? So for example, I know that some people who have a uh, close contact with the uh, contagious people still uh, don't get the virus. So I feel like is it because like some, as I mentioned, it's because something in their genes so that they can be uh, protected. So in so in this case, if we can test like some, um, uh, so we can test like if this kind of people has like some healthy people or look like they're healthy has the gene, we can directly like is. Uh, exclude these people and uh, uh, could make them do some more risky work. So for um, and also for some uh, people who um, like don't have the symptom, but actually they have the virus, we could use other testing methods. So we should, I think, we should divide people into different groups and test them with different methods. I think it's will have higher uh, efficiency because we can better control the situation. So this is what you would do here, correct? You would, uh, you would start to categorize people healthy and then uh, healthy is healthy, but infected, non-symptomatic, infected, light symptomatic, infected, very symptomatic, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, and actually, that's where I was going with, with this discussion, is talk a little bit about, really there are two types of tests, okay? One test that looks if you have the disease now. And the other test is a test that looks if you had the disease, if you have antibodies to the disease. And I think, Kathy, your point here is a very well taken point. Um, is a very interesting research question or intellectual question why some people really don't get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or we don't know, maybe they get it, but it's so light that uh, it's so light that, that you cannot measure it, or at least a person doesn't feel it. There was a um, uh, two days ago in um, Two days ago in CNN, this guy Farid Zakaria, one of the reporters, was putting a big pitch, a big discussion about non-symptomatic, uh, non-symptomatic cases. And let me ask you, let me tell you the point he made. He says, let's suppose, and I made this point maybe two lectures ago, um, let's suppose that for every 10 people that get uh, corona, nine are non-symptomatic. It's an exaggeration. Mo most likely he was arguing between 50 and 75 percent. Okay, what is, the, what is the conclusion there? The conclusion there is that uh, the disease is not as dangerous with the, the numbers are telling us that three percent of the people that are detected finish up passing away, okay? But if, if for every one of those people, there are 10 people that have it, but were not detected, uh, then the mortality rate, instead of being 3%, is, one, is 3 tenths of 1%, which is about three times the mortality rate of a regular flu. Come so many people are dying if that would be the case. 
I was going to raise the same question. <laughs> I want to hear other people. Abby, what's your opinion? Yeah, I I actually I'm told by this argument. Uh, I also heard many people saying that based on such and such uh, statistics, they argue that the coronavirus is not so deadly. But uh, if that's the case, then we shouldn't see the bad situations in the hospital where many people are dying. So, um, so I'm not sure about the validity of this statement. Farid Zakaria, now the, the counter argument to that is that maybe the reason so many people are dying is because the number of people infected is very large. And the large infestation is because all these people with contagious situation are walking around without knowing that they are sick and contaminating people. If the ratio is 1 to 10, in the US, what is? I think the number is something like 600,000 people have been detected contaminated uh, or something like that, 5,000. Uh, then multiplied by 10, there are 5 million people contaminated in the US, which is still a reasonably small percentage of the population, which is like 2% of the population. So we would expect that to be much more than that uh, contamination, correct? I think it's a combination of that. It's probably maybe because it's so contagious and because, again, um, a lot of people who are infected might not know it or they're just uh, giving it to people. But, but at the same time, I think it, the, the reason we're seeing so many deaths is because we're seeing them all at once. So. Um, like in the number of deaths maybe for the flu uh if they happen during a year because this is just happened within two months we're seeing everything happening at once so maybe the number might not be um if that's really the number to be spread over a bigger period of time might not be perceived as big i don't know that might be another uh, way if that's really gonna the only number, uh, and it happened all at once, then it might be the reason why it seems to be such a big number. Okay. And so the question, uh, so there are two things test. One test, do you have it now? The other one, have you been infected? Uh, then the question that Andrea and Abby lay is what percentage of the population have been affected? Okay. Now, Two very important questions in relation to test. First, is the test correct? Okay, and there have been some arguments that 50% of the cases are not detected, and in the other side, there are several false positives too. Um, okay, now, what is the situation of testing in the US? Maybe at this moment, two and a half million people were tested, less than 1% of the US population. Um, second, second case is the US basically did not test uh, for a long time. So those numbers of how many people died, how many people were infected, absolutely mean nothing. Um, I think we can probably say, okay, the test is reasonably valid. One more thing to be taught in, in audit population is this. What was the method of sampling? I'm talking auditing, not uh, health. What was the method of sampling to administer the sparse tests that we have? Can anyone respond to that? The question about how to apply sampling method to evaluate the no, percentage. No, the, qu the question is, we tested two and a half million people in the United States. How do we decide who get tested? That's a, sam a population selection, a sample selection. 
Andrea, you want to answer that? So in the oh. go ahead, go ahead. Oh, who so go ahead. how people get misters uh if they have a civil uh um test the patients but if the patient doesn't show really civil symptoms they don't um test those patients because of the limited uh, resources i think that's also connected very, very to good the point of why this is what i was aiming at at I tried to be tested, my daughter tried to be tested, Andrea tried to be tested, and there was all kind of pre-screening criteria. So if we are in this curve, in the already infected but still no symptomatic point here, uh, you will never be allowed to be tested. And these guys here that mixed with this population here will not be tested. So uh, I think there's kind of whole percentage of how many people uh, were symptomatic after they were tested is just a very bad number because the testing was so filtering and so skewed and the testing really doesn't measure anything on this population here. Jumi, do you agree with that? Yes, yes, I do. And I think that's, yeah, that's the reason we get higher, um, higher that compared to some of the countries like, I don't know, maybe China or South Korea, uh, because uh, uh, in US, less people tested. That's why it, it seems like more people die, but actually, like, as you said, there are more people who needs to be tested, but not tested. Yeah. Yeah, meaning, and the, and what you just said is is really the crux of the issue here. Needs to be tested, and what the question is, who needs to be tested for epidemiological reasons and for understanding better the problem. I think entire populations should be tested and should be tested every day. Correct. Yes, I think I think so because like it's like exponentially increasing. So people who got got it should be tested and people that person uh people that per the patient contacted also need to be tested although they don't see any because there's a, some of the period that they people doesn't show the symptom but they are still contagious so that uh if if the government if to really control all those situations then people who the, the people who patient contacted everybody needs to be tested i think yeah, or at least if you're an auditor, what would you do to understand what's happening with a population? So, I think. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I I do agree, and I do think it's very important for the entire population to be tested, or at least. Um, uh, get uh, a sample of the population that includes everyone, not not targeted to people who are uh, experiencing symptoms, but get a sample that at least uh, includes everyone, and just keep testing them for a while, just to see to see some trends, and then ex extrapolate it to the population. But I think it is very important in order to understand how this is uh, behaving, uh, just to see, um, you know. Uh, like a, a sample of the, the, the healthy population as well, uh, mixed with people who are not, and just uh, follow them to see maybe when they start to experience symptoms, who starts to experience symptoms, how many people start to experience symptoms, and, and, and understand a little bit more of the real statistics, if the population yeah, is there. Yeah, one more no point about that is uh, you cannot assume that this is a homogeneous population because contagious is by proximity. So a certain region of the population will be contaminated and other region of the population will not. And you can do your analysis by state, by zip code, uh, by country, by the world. And each one's going to tell you a different story. True, yes. Okay. Um, now my question is, what can the, what can the government do? Obviously, the major step is social distancing. 
second thing about the government is intervening on the death rate by providing facilities, respirators, masks, etc., etc., etc. But you know, it's very easy to knock the government on this. I mean, the supply chain of the United States wasn't designed uh, to provide uh, half a billion masks in a month. Okay, so any of these ramping up and provisioning takes not only resources that could be feeding the poor or could be feeding the children or could be building roads and moving it to creating masks or providing respirators, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I'm not defending the government. I think the government botched this very badly. But what I'm saying is, it's easy to, to knock it. Um, okay, now the next thing is, the population is panicked. What should the government say? There is no epidemics, let's lie. I think the government just need to be objective to tell the truth, uh, um, um, but they cannot lie about the situation because otherwise more people will get infected. Yeah, if the government makes it non-scary, less people respect socially distance, social distancing and all the hygienic measures. Okay, the other thing the government can do is block transportation. Okay, and that government has the ability to do. Stop airplanes, uh, stop cars in the road, uh, control subways, and et cetera, et cetera. The other thing the government can do is facilitate quarantine. Okay, the situations, a, a ship comes in, you quarantine everyone on that. People fly in from China. Uh, from the US to China, you quarantine them, etc. There are the things government can do. Okay, and there are many other things the government can do. Let me just go to the next one. I, I want to come back to this in a second. Okay, now this is the, the other thing I put in here is a macroeconomic issue. Um, the moment you create the social distancing and limit transportation, you create large amount of unemployment. Uh, you know, there are some people saying that uh, we'll have 30% of the U.S. population unemployed, which is an astounding number, okay? Uh, the other thing is the banking system is a very well-balanced system. You borrow, you lend, et cetera, et cetera. And when one side of the so people are not doing business or so no one is borrowing, uh, but they borrow for personal reasons, so the whole thing this balances. Uh, we have experience with that. That happened 2003, 2008. So the government has some kind of palliative to deal with that. The government basically back up the banks. Okay, but you know people don't know how much that is. Uh, how what is the effect? Can the government invent 20 trillion dollars of money? and not have an inf inflationary or just a total devaluation, like in, uh, in German uh, uh, in during the war, where, or in Hungary, when I was going, when I just was born, where you were, if you go to the car lab, you see these bonds on the wall, and they are like a trillion foreigns, a billion foreigns. So zeros plus zeros plus zeros. You know, it's a possibility that the US dollar will devalue. Actually, in 2008, I was totally convinced that the dollar would devalue in relation to the real Brazilian currency or to the euro. Actually, that didn't happen. It went the other way. The dollar went up in value because people perceived the dollar to be uh, more stable. Okay. A couple of other things. Industry rebalancing. Some businesses are doing very well. You know, if you are Federal Express, or your Amazons, you're hiring people desperately. And one more thing, I said four trillion, that's my guess, is what is the effect of the government intervening 
you know, already two trillion, and there'll be probably a couple more trillion, and there'll be some bank law, bank guarantees that are not part, part of the number. It's a big story here. So I'm going to talk about a couple of other points, and then I'm going to ask uh, Wenu to say a little bit what she's doing, uh, and I'm going to ask Han Chi to say something what she's doing. Uh, the other points. Uh, is this is a dynamic phenomenon. Day after day, the situation changes. People get contagion. People get aggravated the health state. People lose the jobs. Uh, people die. People leave hospitals. Second, the measurements we have are very bad. I, mean, we, I think we proved that point. And the third thing is that this is a interesting story because small events can have very big consequences. This is trying to be the word big. For example, when I was going to Singapore, I decided not to go. Uh, there was a conference in Singapore with 120 participants. And when someone was Contagious, was contagious there, um, probably not sick, and that little event transmitted to Europe, transmitted to the United States, transmitted even to Taiwan and to Malaysia. So it's a very, very difficult thing to monitor. And then one more thing is the exogenous variable story is from one second to the other, you know, you're hearing in the newspapers that all this you know, like the Hungarian uh, president is using this as an excuse to oppress and to dominate and to take privacy. But this is a trade-off thing. I think Xin Xin would be here, and Adrian, they would say, this is a situation of jam. You give up a little bit of privacy, but you create better government services and better custody for the clients, for the, the people. 